So you want to start playing Battle Spirit Saga and or Battle Spirits. Well, you've come to the right place. In this video, I run over the very basics you'll need to know as a Battle Spirits player to not embarrass yourself on Extreme Game. <laughs> Let's get right into it. Step 1. Basic setup. Battle Spirits is a two-player card game, so both Spirits and Saga have different deck building rules and restriction lists, so make sure to look into those for your respective format. But the most basic thing to note is that Battle Spirits runs on a deck count of at least 40 with at least 3 copies of each card, whereas Saga runs on at least 50 with at least 4 copies of each card. Once you've got your deck built and your Tupperware of cores, you are ready to gate open Kaiho. Both players will draw to 4 in their opening hand, and both players will start with 5 cores in life. As well as 4 cores in reserve, with one of these cores being the Soul Core. The Soul Core is a special core used to pay for special effects, but we'll get into those later. Now to the Saga side of things, which Spirit doesn't have is Mulligan. After deciding which player goes first through Rock, Paper, Scissors, rolling a die, or a quick round of Smash Bros, you can take your mulligan. To mulligan and battle spirits, you set your entire hand to the bottom and draw four new cards and shuffle to get ready for play. One important new rule is that if you keep your opening hand without any mulligans, you get to start with an extra card. With mulligans complete, let's go ahead and go into the flow of a turn. Step two, the turn flow. There are seven steps in a turn, start step, core step, draw step, refresh step, which all are happening very quickly at the beginning of your turn, then you enter the main step, where you summon spirits, deploy nexuses, cast magics, and throw slurs at your opponent because you walked into a burst, and once you're ready, you can go into the attack step. The attack step is a very important phase of the turn, so we will give it a little bit of extra attention later, but once you are satisfied with the damage you've done, or if you have nothing left else to do, you proceed to the end step and pass it to your opponent. The start step is just acknowledging that you are now the turn player, and during the core step, the second player turn onwards gets a core from the void. And the void is just extra cores to be used as turns progress, and they put that core from the void into the reserve. Which is to say, turn 1 player starts at 4 cores, and turn 2 player starts at 5. During the draw step, you draw from your top deck, simple enough, and during the refresh step, you can refresh all of your used cores, move them back from trash back into reserve, and in your refresh step, you can also refresh any of your exhausted spirits. Something in the spirit side of things that isn't in Saga yet is, is heavy exhaustion. If you have a spirit that's heavy exhausted, you can refresh it once back into the exhaust state, then you would need another refresh step to get it back into the refresh state. Once your refresh step is done, you're ready to go into the main phase where you're going to be playing and summoning most of your cards. I also want to mention the movement of cores in the main step, which is unfortunately sometimes overlooked. One of the less known things you can do in the main step is the free movement of cores, and when I say free, I mean free. You have full freedom as to what you want to do with your cores. You can move them from amongst the field to the reserve, just not randomly sending cores to trash for no reason. If you wanted to, I don't know, put all of your cores onto one spirit, and then deplete the rest of them, that is A-OK. -okay. If you want to spread them amongst all the different spirits you have, that is A-OK -okay as well. If you wanted to, I don't know, wipe your own board and put all your cores back into your reserve, that is A-OK -okay as well. You have full control of what to do with your cores in the main phase. Now, the other timing you have for core movement is when you summon a spirit, and I'll call this summon core movement where you can move cores from your field or reserve to that summoned spirit, then comes a check timing to check for depletion or destruction or on summon effects. And then after that, you can fully free move cores again. So for examples, let's say I pay the cost for this spirit here. So at this point in time, as it's being summoned, I can move cores whatever ways I want. I can move one from the reserve onto that spirit. I can even move this core from this spirit onto this spirit as well and here, and then once I've agreed that this is how many cores I want to summon onto that spirit, there comes a check timing where the game will now recognize that this spirit is now depleted or destroyed because of its zero cores, and it will go to the trash after. 
And normally you don't want to do that because otherwise you probably do want to keep your spirits on board. But that's just something for you guys to know. So the other thing you can do here is after summon it, you can just move to there. Then at this point, once everything's all fully done on their summon, go ahead and just move course once again freely. At this point where there's nothing happening, you have free movement of course again. Now that we're done with the general aspect of the main phase, let's go ahead and take a look as to what cards you summon, deploy, and cast in Battle Spirits and Saga. Step 3 will be understanding a card. Let's take a look at this example here. Sarume. First thing to note about a card is its cost and its reduction symbols. This has 3 cost and 2 reduction, 1 red, 1 white. Simply put, if you have no cores or white symbols on board, it would cost you 3 cores to pay for Sarume summon and then you need one more core to summon it at level 1. And that's one of the things that might throw off someone new to Battle Spirits is the concept of maintenance cost. When you summon a spirit, you have to summon it to at least level 1. But continuing on the play cost of the card, if you had a white symbol on board from a play prior, this would then only cost 2. And if you had a red symbol, this would then only cost 1 to play. Simple math. Next, we can look towards its effect. So effects in Battle Spirits, though not listed anywhere, do have subtypes similarly to Cardfight Vanguard and Yu-Gi-Oh. You can have continuous skills that will continually be active so long as the condition is met, ignition skills, or even act skills that require you to perform an activation to activate it, such as exhausting the spirit or paying an extra amount of cores, and then trigger skills or auto skills. And these are effects that activate when a timing has been met, such as itself being summoned. There are a few different timings to expect and look for. The most common ones, like I said, are on summon, on attack, or on deploy. Some continuous effect timings will state during your main phase or while it's attacking or during your attack phase. And like I said, some ignition skills such as during your main step by exhausting this spirit maybe draw a card. Unfortunately, a lot of the timing brackets in Battle Spirits does require contextual knowledge of the effect to know which category it lies under. So big props to the Saga side of the game for differentiating between while attacking and when attacks. In Sarume's case, she has, when this spirit is summoned, perform the following effect. She also has the main phase continuous effect here. This spirit gains one extra red symbol. So she's able to help provide extra reduction for cards that need a red and a white reduction. But I digress. This was just an example of a spirit card that has both an on trigger effect as well as a continuous effect. Now let's take a look at its power. Sarume has two level thresholds, level one and level two. Some spirits will even go up to level four. The two numbers you see represent the number of cores required and what level you become, and as you reach these higher levels, your spirit unlocks more effects and becomes stronger. For example, this is my friend, 51st Sengoku Dragon, Soul Dragon. Soul Dragon is actually another spirit that goes all the way up to level 4 with 6 cores. Level 3 with 4 cores and get stronger and stronger based on what level it reaches. And like I said, as you get stronger, you also unlock new skills. He has his when summoned effect trigger at level one, two, three, four, but at level two, three, four is when he gets his second skill, his when attacks effects. So if there's anything to take away from the spiel about levels, it's knowing how to balance your core placement and to make the most out of the power you have on the board, as well as the effects as well. So, aside spirits, you also have nexuses. These are basically what you can think of as landmarks on your board. Speaking of your board, I also want to mention that there is no upper limit on anything within the game. No upper limit on cards on board, no upper limits on cards in hand, and no upper limits on cores. Go wild with that knowledge, if you will. Nexuses are, in my opinion, one of the strongest card types in the game, as they are a symbol on board that do not require a maintenance level, whereas spirits cannot exist with zero cores on it as their minimum level, level one, requires at least one core. Many nexuses do have their level one maintenance as zero cores, 
Nexuses provide various effects that can help bolster your strategy or hinder your opponents. Find the perfect balance in your deck and find the perfect balance between spirits and nexuses. Strong as they might be, too many nexuses might give you very many powerful effects on the board, but your nexuses can't attack or block, so while your opponent is playing battle spirits, you're playing battle nexus. Finally, the third type of card you commonly see, magic cards. Magic cards are exactly what they sound like. One-time usage cards that do their effect and go to trash right after or sometimes other places depending on their effect. Most magic cards can be cast during the main step, but they also have a different effect during the flash timing as well, which we will get to talk to as we talk about more in the attack step. A subtype of card you will see as well are burst cards. Burst cards are the same as any other card type they are associated with. You can only set one burst per turn and you can only have one set burst at a time. If you want to change your burst, you have to discard your current one. When something happens in the game that meets the condition of your burst, examples given, your opponent added cards to their hand, your opponent destroyed your spirit, you can declare your burst activation and follow through on the effect. These are very powerful effects that can swing the tempo of a game in one fell swoop, so keep an eye out for these. The last kind of card does not exist in Saga yet, but this is what we'll call a Mirage. A Mirage is basically a card that goes over your burst. It stays in the burst zone as well. After paying the cost for the Mirage, you can set the Mirage and basically it kind of acts like a field spell that both you and your opponent have to be aware of. But you can mostly expect to see these three different kind of cards as you go about your games in Battle Spirits and Saga. Get familiar with them and get familiar with finding the perfect balance between the three types to optimize your deck's game plan. And now we enter step four, the attack step. The attack step is where war is waged, where spirits start throwing hands at each other to determine who gets our Lord and Savior Penton's favor. In the attack step, you, you, uh, you attack and you block. Or during the attack step is where the most fun part of battle spirits occurs, the flash typing. So, during the turn player's attack step, they can choose to declare an attack with any refresh spirit by exhausting that spirit and declaring an attack. At this point, any on tap or when your opponent's spirits attacks from your opponent's side of things effects would activate, then they would resolve, and once everything is fully resolved, we enter the flash timing. An easy way to remember is that the defending player always has the first flash. In the flash timing, players can then use any effects from hand on field that have flash timing to try and control the battle, gain tempo, gain power, various things to be able to do. As Saga grows and grows, the more things that are available in the flash timing will exist. And my favorite is Advent. Oh, we love Advent. But yes, the flash timing flow is such. The turn player declares attack. Defending player has first flash priority. Turn player has second flash priority. If neither have flash here, the flash timing is passed and we go into block declaration. At this point, the defending player can choose to block or not. If they choose to not block, they take damage from the life. Or, um, life do you The damage taken is equal to the number of symbols on the attacking spirit. But various things can change this, such as Braves and Brave Spirits, or some spirits just having two symbols to start off in the first place. If they do choose to block, however, we enter a second flash timing. Once again, Defending Player has the first flash priority and then back to Turn Player. And once all flashes are done, then we enter the BP comparison stage, and the stronger of the two destroys the other in battle. In a more advanced video, I'll do... I'll explain about many timings, but keep in mind that there are many effects in Battle Spirits that can trigger off of just exhausting your spirit to declare an attack. But Saga is still in its infancy, and the very basis that you do need to know is the two flash timings associated with an attack declaration. Step 5. Winning the game. There are a few ways to win the game in Battle Spirits, and in Saga, the most common way is to hit your opponent for... 5 damage and make their life hit 0. Water is wet. But if either player cannot perform the draw for the turn, they also lose. 
This is more of a commonly seen blue strategy that looks to destroy your opponent's deck and avoid battle and win in their own scummy way. Now that you know the very basics of the game, get out there and open some gates so you can Kaiho. I hope this was helpful for getting you into, if not at the very least interested, in the deep interactions that Battle Spirits and Saga have waiting for you. Socials are down... Socials are down in the description below if you want to stay connected, and you can also join the Discord for remote and TTS opportunities if you're looking to play some Battle Spirits or learn. The community I have is very helpful and always looking for prey. I mean fellow summoners to play with. In any case, this has been Toka from Yellow Card Battle Spirits, and I will see you next time.